Okay, thank you. Well, quick introduction, leave as much time as we can for our presenter as uh, possible. State Representative Chuck Eisenhardt here, member of the Veterans Affairs Committee in the Iowa House. Several years ago, as part of a, um, a meeting of the Council of State Governments, we had a meeting in Kansas City. We had a day trip that included a visit to the Veterans Community Project in Kansas City. Uh, was very impressed by what we saw at that time. They were considering uh, expanding their footprint to other cities. Um, and now that's become a reality. And our speaker today, Jason Kander is, I think I got this right, Vice President for National Expansion uh, for the Veterans Service Project. And he's gonna talk today about um, the project and how it works uh, and perhaps a little bit of information on how their work could be expanded to Iowa if there is interest in that. And just as an aside, maybe an important aside, because I think it's significant. Uh, Jason is the author of a, an award-winning book uh, named Invisible Storm that recounts his own personal journey with uh, PTSD and how that impacted his personal life and his own political career. So that may intersect a little bit with today's conversation as well. So thank you for joining us, Jason, and take it away. Uh, well, great. Th first of all, uh, thank you, Representative, for having me. Um, I, I appreciate it very much. Um, yeah, I, let me, uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, by way of getting into the story of Veterans Community Project, I'll share just a little bit more of, of my my personal story because uh, it's it's relevant here. Um, and also, you know, I, I used to be a counterpart to y'all in Missouri. I used to be a, a Missouri state legislator. So, um, so I, uh, uh, I'm as um, rep as the representative said, I'm the president of National Expansion at, at Veterans Community Project. Um, but before that, uh, I was the Secretary of State of Missouri and some other things. And then before that, I was a member of the state legislature here in Missouri. And then before all that, I was uh, uh, a captain in the United States Army, served in Afghanistan, um, and you know went that whole political career um, trying to basically outrun post-traumatic stress. Uh, that I had sustained um, in Afghanistan, uh, and it was actually Veterans Community Project um, that uh, helped me uh, get the help that I need, and um, that was um, coming up on five years ago now, uh, and now I've spent almost the last nearly four years as the president of National Expansion here, because I'm a, a huge believer in, in what we do, so um, I'm really interested in, uh, in potentially being able to bring this to Iowa. I appreciate y'all's interest in helping make that possible. Um, I think the target would probably be Des Moines, um, and I've had some initial conversations uh, with them, but we can get back into all that in a, in a minute. Let me start uh, this presentation where I just kind of tell you about who we are and what we do, um, and then uh, I'll try and have this not too long, and then I'll be able to answer any questions y'all have. So, um, you know, you probably, given that you all serve uh, in some capacity or another on a, on a Veterans Affairs Related Committee, you're familiar with numbers like this. Uh, I like to point out that numbers like this are actually pretty low because what this is taking into account uh, is um, VA eligible veterans, folks who, uh, you know, are in that 60 to 70 percent of, of uh, people we would consider veterans who have the uh, option of going to the VA if they're enrolled. Um, and so that doesn't account for people who were uh, maybe you know not considered to be active duty for long enough or don't have the discharge status that the federal government prefers. There's a lot of people who all of us on this Zoom call would consider to be veterans uh, who the federal government doesn't consider to be veterans. Um, at Veterans Community Project, we use a very simple definition, which is if you ever raised your right hand and swore the oath uh, to serve in the military, you qualify for 100% of our services. We consider you a veteran. We don't really have any further questions about your eligibility. Um, and that's important because I think when you take into account that population, uh, this number is probably 20 to 30% higher nationwide. Um, uh, as far as the folks we've served, um, you know, here's some of those numbers because uh, people are, are often curious about them. I'm going to go through this not totally quickly, but a little quickly so we can get to to um, questions. Um, something that a lot of people don't realize uh, is that one, veterans are twice as likely to become chronically homeless, but two, that female veterans are the fastest growing demographic. Uh, I like to point out here that 
homelessness for uh, females generally is a lot more harrowing and dangerous. Um, and uh, for female veterans, particularly those that might have been victims of military sexual assault, that kind of thing. Um, our model, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, of the tiny house model is particularly relevant for them because of, uh, of the safety aspects of it. Um, a lot of you, probably all of you, are familiar with this top number that on average 20 veterans a day die uh, from um, suicide in the United States. Uh, what most people don't know is that on average out of that 20, 16 of them were not connected to any veteran specific services of any kind at the time uh, that they take their life. And that's a hugely important number because one of the things we do, as I mentioned, is we lower that barrier to entry down to almost nothing for veterans, uh, which gives us the opportunity to connect a lot more veterans with veteran specific services, which you know saves a lot of lives as a result. What we do, we do uh, transitional housing with a really unique case management method, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, we do this through partnerships with uh, other social services. We don't uh, employ the therapists or the physicians or the dentists, um, the you know substance counselors, the job trainers, or you name it. We don't actually employ those folks. We employ case managers um, who then liaise with the rest of the community to connect veterans directly with those services, whether those be veteran specific services or not. It's about shortening the distance for our veterans between themselves and the services that they need. Uh, this allows us to run very lean, but it also allows us to operate in a community without um, replicating services that already exist and instead to be there as a complement, uh, not you know a competitor to these sort of services, which is, is really important. Um, and then finally, what this all does is it creates these meaningful ways for the community to connect with veterans and vice versa. Uh, I like to refer to this part of it as we are the jumbotron method, which is to say, you know, you go to a ball game and they put a veteran on the jumbotron and everybody stands and applauds uh, and thanks them for their service. And then you have this feeling that's sort of like, is that it? Like, it feels like there should be something else that we can do. Uh, and we're the answer to that question. Um, we are where you go after the Jumbotron, because whatever it is you do, if you live in a community that has a Veterans Community Project campus, uh, you can do that for veterans at our campus. If, you know, whether you're a mechanic or a veterinarian, our, our veterans have animals. Provide that service uh, at Veterans Community Project. Uh, anybody who hasn't muted wants to maybe do that. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we keep it pretty simple. Uh, if you serve the country, if you raise your right hand, um, we're going to serve you. You qualify for 100% of our services. Uh, this is what a VC pillar, VCP village looks like. Um, as you can see, these are tiny houses. They are, on average, about 240 square feet. That's our model. Um, there, we also do uh, about roughly 10 percent, 10 to 20 percent of our of our homes in each. Actually, we're now at in each location that we build. 20 percent of our homes are going to be 320 square feet, and they are family units. They have the capacity to have a couple people in them at a time, uh, which. Uh, has been a really interesting part of, of our learning curve, which is that when we take people in who may have you know, been on a homelessness journey for a while, one of the things that happens is they often are able to reconnect with uh, their children and with other family members. And uh, they will often within, you know, we are transitional housing, they're with us on an average of about 10 months. Um, oftentimes during that period, they will transition within the village into a family unit so that they can have uh, you know, visitation or even, uh, you know, weekend custody uh, with their kids, which they haven't been able to do in a long time. So um, that's that's what it looks like. That large building you see there is the community center. Um, that is uh, where the veterans, while they're living in the, in the village, are going to receive the vast majority of their services. And the logic behind that is that, and uh, I'm sure there's folks on this call who have served in the military, when you're on active duty in the military, uh, and you're living on post, one of the things that happens is you get pretty much all your services uh, in one place. You know, the place where you go to get your haircut and the place where you buy your groceries and the bank you use are usually in the same building. Uh, and you get pretty used to that way of living. And then you come out into the world and you really need a lot of the life skills of just being able to navigate the community to go and, and 
get the services, go to the jobs, navigate the transportation in order to be successful. And so when they come into the village, we are really restarting their military to civilian transition back at day one, even if they've been homeless for two decades. And so when they start in the village, they're going to receive a lot of their services in that building, the community center, which is also where their case manager is going to be. Uh, and then gradually over the course of their time with us, they will transition out into receiving their services elsewhere in the community so that by the time that they are what we call permanent housing ready, uh, they're just like anybody else in town. They, they know where they get their various services. They've got their job that they go to. They probably are going to have a car uh, and they're stable and they're ready to be successful and not recidivate into homelessness. Uh, and that's when they transition out, either into an apartment, sometimes into home ownership, things like that. Um, and we do this, by the way, and I'm sure I have a slide later that'll get to it, but I'm going to jump ahead, uh, at an 85% success rate. Um, now, if you talk to people in the transitional housing world for homelessness, they'll tell you that anybody who can hit 40%, uh, that's kind of the gold standard. Um, and the reason that Veterans Community Project uh, is special and talked about a lot is because we're hitting an unprecedented 85% success rate of uh, transitioning folks out of homelessness and into uh, permanent successful housing situations. So that said, um, as we build these, we usually uh, use a lot of volunteers. It helps us connect with the community um, and it helps us with our ongoing fundraising later. Um, I'm gonna show you inside one of the tiny houses in a second, but as you can see, you know, we believe in, in housing with dignity. We do not see these folks as people who are, um, you know, uh, formerly homeless. Uh, we, we see them as people who serve their country and we treat them as such. Uh, and look, those of us who lead this organization, um, we feel like, you know, any one of us could have needed one of the houses instead of been working at the national uh, headquarters. So we designed them with that in mind. Um, they are trauma informed um, in the sense that they are built specifically for people with PTSD uh, in the way uh, architecturally on the inside, little things like no unit in the village uh, looks directly into uh, another unit to create that privacy. Obviously the tiny home also gives you that locking door aspect, which is very different than what uh, most transitional housing for veterans looks like. Um, and uh, and then on top of that, it's little things like the bed faces the door, stuff like that. So uh, that said, we'll keep going. Oh, I lost my. There we go. Uh, this is what it looks like inside. Um, it's an extremely efficient use of space. This is a view from the door or from the the bed, looking back at the door. What you can't see in this picture is that if you were able to turn just to the left, you would see a, a full bathroom, shower, uh, you know, toilet, sink. Uh, the whole deal. Um, there's a full kitchen there. Um, and uh, and when they walk in uh, and they have the view from walking into the door, what they're told is that everything they see, chair, bed, television, laptop, dishes, uh, everything uh, is theirs. They own it now. Um, we Every single time we move a veteran in, we uh, flip a house first. We completely you know do a makeover of the house. Uh, and we put in donated, but new. We don't use used uh, furniture in these. It's all donated, but brand new. Uh, and they're told when you transition out of here into your permanent living situation, this all goes with you, which is a huge deal because these people come in usually with one bag. Uh, and now when they leave, they have a nest egg. They don't, they don't have to go buy all these things. They can really start fresh. Uh, and so that's a very effective part of our model. Um, these are the five supports. These are our, This is what we do um, in our system uh, in order to gauge when people are ready, uh, permanent housing ready. These are the five areas that, that we focus on. I won't condescend to read them to you, um, but as you can see, uh, it kind of covers the main supports that people would need. One that I'll touch on real quick um, is uh, education and training. You know, one of the most common questions that I get is, you know, do you, do you provide job training? Um, and yes, we do. We do provide job training. But uh, I would say that the other two supports that really um, have the most to do with the job training aspect of what we do are fiscal understanding and income stability. Because a lot of our veterans come to us with employment. And also, unlike a lot of the rest of the homelessness community, everybody in one of our villages can read and write. Everybody in one of our villages has had job training. Uh, and they've all faced down adversity at some point in their life. 
So oftentimes it's other traumas, other things going on in their life that have affected their fiscal understanding, have affected their income stability. And we do a lot of work on that. But these folks, they're very employable um, and they're going to they're going to do very well. It's about stabilizing a lot of the rest of this stuff. And so a lot of the times the education and training, it can be them going back to school, but it can frequently be helping them translate their resume and find a, uh, a career, uh, not just a job. Um, I mentioned this before. Um, this is our average stay. We do not cap how long someone can stay with us. Um, and this is, uh, as I said, 85% success rate. Uh, another aspect of what we do um, is the emergency assistance program and the outreach program. So in addition to the residential program um, that I've been talking about here, we have this whole other half of what we do that gets a little less play and a little less attention because people like tiny houses, right? Uh, that gets the focus. Um, but we operate outreach centers. Um, that's how, when I told you my story at the beginning, that's how I came into the organization. And that is, it doesn't matter what your income, employment, or housing situation is. If you are a person who raised your right hand, you can qualify for our outreach operation, which helps you navigate uh, services, whether they be veteran-specific or otherwise. Um, and this is where we help people with you know, uh, grants, small grants that might keep them in their house, might help them pay their tuition, might help them with transportation so they can keep a job, connect them with mentors, all sorts of different things. And through that part of our program, we serve thousands of people a year at our campuses. Whereas with our tiny home model, our residential program, you're looking at um, usually between 75 and 100 people a year uh, at a campus being served. So we're able to serve a much broader population in preventing homelessness and preventing suicide on the outreach side. Um, I just sort of talked through this because I forgot that this slide is here. Uh, a little bit about, this is an older presentation, um, so this is a little bit just specifically about Kansas City, um, but it's a pretty good model. We're not that far from Des Moines. Uh, I'm going to get into some of the other campuses in a moment. Um, again, going back to our model uh, of drawing on the services throughout the community, um, it's really our goal when we build a campus to have everybody in town uh, touch the project at some point, right? Either through a work project uh, at their job or just, or their church or however, one way or another, being able to come in and volunteer um, so that when they see people wearing the shirts in town, they feel a, a real sense of ownership over it, which is important because the vast majority of our, of our fundraising is on the private side and we need to have people in town who feel a connection. Um, national expansion, um, a little bit about what we're doing here. Uh, this is, as I said, I, I, I apologize, I grabbed one of the older slide decks. I just, I, I, uh, <laughs> I'm at home today and I couldn't get into the system where I have the newer ones. So I apologize for that. It, that's why I don't have up-to-date pictures. I'm showing you the old renderings, but the um, this, uh, we're getting pretty close in Boulder County, Colorado now to housing veterans. We've been providing services for well over a year there. And um, so if you look on our website, there, there are actual pictures of this project. Um, same deal in St. Louis. Um, we're actually, of all things, waiting on a, uh, on a electrical box part in order to be able to do the ribbon cutting uh, in St. Louis. That's a supply chain issue because we are fully ready to house veterans in St. Louis. And it's actually like our, our biggest and prettiest campus to date. Um, so we're pretty excited about getting to that point. Um, Sioux Falls, South Dakota uh, has a couple of vertical houses at this point. It uh, doesn't quite look like this yet. Um, but it's it's on its way there. Um, and so we're making a lot of progress there. Um, so that's a, a brief you know look at them. Let me tell you about what one of these costs. Uh, and uh, and this is a presentation I gave somewhere. So that's a picture of I think Oklahoma City. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but let me tell you, let me just answer some of the most common. Accidentally muted him. No problem. Are you, here we go. We're good now. Uh, I'll I'll answer uh, some of the most common initial questions. Um, one, the vast majority of our fundraising is uh, usually uh, private fundraising. The reason for that is because, as I mentioned, we do some things much different than the federal model. Uh, I talked about the fact that we serve uh, anybody who who served their country. We don't have a narrow definition of veteran. Other stuff uh, would include we have a wider definition of homelessness. Um, which allows us to help more people who are in a housing unstable situation. Um, a big one is, and a big part of our success, is that we operate uh, at a 10 to 1 client to case manager ratio, which is very low. 
Whereas um, most VA funded programs, the VA requires them to operate at a minimum of 25 to one, or they're not considered efficient. I've been to some of those programs. I, I think it really harms their services. Um, so with all that said, we have, we're really not eligible for hardly any federal funding. There's been one instance where we were able to navigate some federal funding, um, but we have been able to take some public funding, which I know is what we're talking about here. Uh, uh, an analogous example is that in Missouri, uh, when medical marijuana passed, there was a part of that law that said that a portion of the proceeds for the state needed to go to veteran-specific services. Uh, we did qualify for uh, $1.8 million dollars in those funds, which we have put toward construction of our St. Louis village. Um, but I, you know, still at this point, I'd say 98% of what we've raised uh, has been on the private side because it doesn't uh, hamstring our services. It doesn't force us to change who we serve or how we do it. Um, and uh, so any opportunity to qualify for public funds that don't come with those typical federal uh, restrictions uh, is an exciting opportunity for us, um, and one that that uh, obviously makes the initial part of going into a community much easier. Because while you know fundraising is always difficult, as every politician on this call knows, um, including me, uh, the, the the fundraising for a five hundred one c three organization that that houses homeless veterans and is doing it in a specific community, going out into that community and raising funds and asking people to sponsor a house and getting a corporate plaque on a house. I, I can tell you that's some of the uh, least hard fundraising I've ever done. But the hard part of it is, is the early dollars. You know, it's before you have a flag planted in a piece of land, before you have um, the first homes going vertical, that can be pretty difficult. And so uh, opportunities like this one, the potential here to qualify for public non-federal dollars uh, that would get um, like say a Des Moines uh, VCP location over that initial hump are very attractive for us. So um, with that said, I'm going to stop talking now uh, and uh, and I'm going to I'm going to take any questions that y'all have. Okay, so I guess I hadn't muted myself in case we had any background noise from here. Apologize for that. Um, we have several people here in the room. I'll start uh, by asking if there's any questions from people in the room. I'll be happy to repeat them in case they can't be heard. Question relates to um, the tiny homes and like if you did have a sponsor covering all the costs of a tiny home, what would that typically be? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an important question. Um, uh, it it uh, varies by community, but I will tell you the most recent village uh, where we've opened uh, housing sponsorships has been um, usually it's 50,000 is what we've done. Um, that's, you know, it goes up and down, give or take. 10 to 20,000, depending on the community and, you know, the cost of building in that community and everything. But 50,000 is, is typically what it is. Now, it would not be, uh, it wouldn't be accurate to say that that covers the entire, like, it's not like if you're like, well, let me back up for a second. When I look at Des Moines, for instance, I had somebody on my team run a needs assessment for Des Moines. And we, we anticipate that if we were to do a Des Moines project, that project would probably require 25 to 30 houses. Uh, so it's not to say that you just take 50,000, you know, times 25 or times 30 and boom, you've paid for the project because uh, you you also have that that 50,000 builds into it, the initial cost of like staff to um, to serve that veteran, uh, it, it, the maintenance for the first year or two. But then on top of that, you've got all the underground, right? You've got all the capital stuff, not to mention the fact that we typically build two commercial buildings as well, uh, a community center and an outreach center. So with all that said, on the development fundraising side, what we typically do is we call a house sponsorship $50,000. Thank you. I see three raised hands in our chat. So I'm going to unmute. Uh... Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Can you tell me what the time frame is from deciding to start a community to um, veterans um, being able to move in and get their services? Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, 
So I'm going to preface my answer with a few assumptions that we'll make, okay? Because uh, I am going to answer the question, but I want to tell you the, the built-in assumptions in my answer. So in this instance, we're assuming a few things. We're assuming uh, that land has been um, identified and acquired, which can sometimes take a few months. Uh, we're assuming that the municipality that we're working with, uh, that uh, the, proce the process of zoning uh, has been accomplished, right? Because there's almost, there's very few communities in the country where you can take a parcel and you can build a village of tiny homes under whatever the existing zoning uh, rule is. There usually has to be either a variance or a rezoning in order to do that. Um, so assuming those two things have been accomplished um, and uh, and at least some initial either public funding or philanthropic seed funding is there, uh, then you're usually looking at 12 to 18 months. Um, and just to expound on this, I'll walk you through sort of what that process looks like. Um, so what, what you would do is if you've got the land and you've got, you know, your clearance from the city, um, you're going to do your design and build your, uh, your, your design. You're going to work with the design from each community. We designed it a little bit different. One, for the contours of the property. And two, we want it to fit into the neighborhood around it. We want it to uh, be relatively seamless. Um, and you're gonna do that, that's like 90 days. And then you're gonna do your infrastructure, your underground, your stuff that's the hardest to fundraise for, right? Because you can't put a, a corporate plaque on a sewer pipe. Um, so you're gonna do that, you're gonna get that built. Um, you're also gonna do your, your utilities if they're not already present on the property. We, one of the things that's unique about us is that every single one of our tiny homes is connected to complete city utilities. So they have access to everything, including Wi-Fi. Uh, and, uh, you're going to do that. And then after that, you're going to be able to start going vertical. And that's when, um, frankly, we could go faster. Um, if you were, you could hire one general contractor and just zip through the whole thing, but we don't do that. What we do instead is, is we do go a little bit slower, usually, uh, in order to incorporate volunteers from across the community. Because like I said, uh, we want the whole, as much of the community as possible to touch the property, because in the future, you're going to have to raise about $1.5 million a year which is very doable. We'll have a, a full-time fundraiser on the ground with our case management staff and our, and our administrative staff, but they need to have the relationships and the contacts to do that. And so having the community uh, build with us really sets the, the, org the local uh, 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 you know, campus up for success in the long run. Thank you. Now I'm uh... Amy Ball is a high-ranking officer in the Disabled American Veterans in the state. Uh, Amy, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, I just have um, three questions. So um, with the tiny homes, are first, are they like built up to code, like, um, the window sizes, insulation, you know, and all that good stuff. And when they are built, who, and if the veterans are moved in, who pays those bills? The veterans or how does that work? Sure. Uh, and I think you had a third question you said. Yeah. And then um, how many beds? So like, uh, if there is a family, because you said, um, you know, yeah, a lot of um, homelessness, uh, a lot of them are female veterans and female veterans have families, their kids. So is there one bed, two beds, what, you know, for their children, you know, how is it just one just for the, the male or female veteran or do you guys do it for their family also, or how is that working? Yeah, um, these are important questions. Thank you for asking. I'll run through them real quick. Uh, so we've got the two different kinds of units, right? The individual unit, which is the majority of our units has one bed uh, for the one individual that'll be in there. We, we never ask people to double up uh, because it's really important that we're housing them with dignity. Um, now, the for the family units, um, what those usually look like on the interior is they have uh, a queen size bed and then there's like a, a built in um, like bunk bed on the other side. So, you know, we like to say you could you could sleep. It's actually a triple bunk um, that we built in. So 
we like to say look, you could sleep five in there comfortably, but you're not going to hang out five people in there during the day, right? But uh, but you know, and we've had a few instances where people take advantage of, of each of those. Um, but usually, what happens is uh, it's it's like we've had some married couples in there. We've also had some married couples with one kid. Um, we frequently, most frequently, what we have is one veteran um, with uh, part time. Uh, custody of a child or two. Uh, in some cases, it's a grandparent with a child or two. So that's usually what it is. It, it can be done uh, comfortably. Now it's transitional housing. Like it's not. It's not meant for. This is how they're going to be forever, right? Like it's too small for that. Um, but for the period of time that the person is going to be with us, it, it works pretty well. Particularly given that it's usually not uh, like a seven days a week, three people in there. Um, uh, as far as cost, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot to mention it myself. Uh, everything that we do is completely free to our our residents and to our veterans. And from the outreach side to the residential side, we never, ever, ever charge a veteran anything. Um, it's one of the other things that makes us different from the VA and the VA funded programs uh, is that we don't require any rent to be paid. Um, now, the reason for that is because we're trying to get these people stable again, right? Uh, if 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 we are saying you've got to have enough um, income stability in order to be able to take some of your income and put it toward rent, well, then we are we're closing ourselves off to a lot of people who we could help transition out of homelessness. Now, what we will frequently do as part of the fiscal understanding part of our programming uh, is we will help those people prepare to be in permanent housing by setting up an account for them. Uh, that might, you know, set aside 30 to 40% of their income at a time so that they're living on 60% of their income, even though they're not paying us rent. And oftentimes we'll help them by putting that toward back debts they may have or a savings account and that kind of thing. But it prepares them to then when they go out uh, into permanent housing and they are paying rent, now they've already got a part of their income stream that they're already used to not spending on anything, but it, that can go toward rent. Um, but we don't we don't charge anything um, to our veterans uh, at all. As far as the houses, um, we're very proud of the way we build our houses. There are tiny home uh, models across the country that uh, don't build to international building codes. They are I've been to some of them. I'm not I'm not trying to disparage anybody else, but that's not our model. Our model is. We build houses that are as nice as yours or mine, or as sturdy as yours or mine. They're just smaller. Um, we build it uh, uh, into compliance with international building codes. We have even had communities that we've gone into in order to incentivize us to come in, offer to waive building code requirements for us, and we have declined. We've told them, no, we want to have to comply with every single code that anybody else who builds a house in your community complies with, uh, again, because this is housing with dignity. So uh, thanks for the questions. Okay, uh, Representative Wilburn, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hey, Representative, how you doing? Good, good to see you again, Jason. It's been a few years since we've- uh... Yeah, it's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Um, sticking along the lines of, uh, of building codes, uh, more so than the program, uh, in the states that you've uh, offered this, I understand you use international building codes, but are you finding that there's issues? Is it- uh, is it some sort of state? Is it uh, the focus on for the tiny homes uh, on uh, local, uh, you know, local zoning uh, codes and issues? Do they tend to do them uh, something straight in their co building code, uh, or are they, you know, is it some type of special exemption that's run through the board of adjustment? Just to give us a flavor on what it would take structurally in terms of uh, zoning for Iowa. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, usually it's very local. Um, you know, usually what we do uh, is we will go and, you know, we end up appearing in front of zoning, local zoning boards, right? So uh, like the, you know, usually it'll be like a planning commission followed by a city council subcommittee. Uh, sometimes it's a county. Um, every once in a while you, when you're building in like a specific area that's got a, a specific zoning adjustment board, you'll go in front of them. But but, you know, in that sense, it's pretty uh, traditional, like any other developer of property, right? We go in and we say, well, this is what we need. Sometimes it's a variance. Sometimes um, it's just, hey, we need it rezoned because sometimes the city has a zoning, um, 
uh, a classification that would work. So it's it's the nice thing is it's not super complicated. It just comes down to one of the things we need initially is buy-in from city officials or county officials, whoever we're dealing with uh, at the outset, because we're not going to go buy property and start raising money if we don't have a, a pretty um, strong assurance that there's not going to be an issue there. Yeah, thanks. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Representative Wilburn. I don't see any more hands up at the moment, and which is maybe good because we're coming up on the end of our time here in the next few minutes. Uh, Jason, I have one question myself. You talked a little bit about community support, and I know a lot of times community support is a function of having um, local community groups uh, partnering with you and behind you. Um, do you have, uh, have you had any conversations with uh, any groups in Iowa? I think one of the things you pride yourself on is being veteran led. Uh, mm -hmm. And so having those relationships with local veterans groups, I assume is important. Do you have folks uh, in Iowa you've been in contact with regarding the potential for a project in Iowa? I'll be honest, we're at the very early stage of this and it's prompted mostly by your initiative, um, which I appreciate. So. You know, I had a, several months ago, I had uh, like sort of an introductory, like having no knowledge that y'all were going to uh, look at the potential of, of this sort of funding. Um, I had sort of an initial conversation with uh, Josh Mandelbaum on the city council in Des Moines uh, and a couple other folks uh, like Des Moines people and sort of an informative early like, hey, would y'all be interested in this? And uh, and so, you know, I actually just messaged him the other day when I heard from you and said, hey, we should sort of reinitiate that conversation. So we're at a very early stage of this, I'll be honest. So it's great that there are representatives of veteran service organizations on this call, because uh, I'd be more than happy to follow up with folks. Um, you know, look, I looked at Des Moines because it's three hours north of where I live, and I spent a fair amount of time there in 2017 and 18, and, uh, and it's a, you know, a large... A population center but you know i'm open to any conversation with anybody in iowa who's interested in doing something like this uh and there's no question that um were we to move forward with this we would need to jumpstart those conversations but that can definitely be done but anybody who's um on this zoom call now who would like to help with that um certainly uh would love to talk to them uh, thank you. I, when I first moved to Des Moines uh, as a legislator in 2009, I stayed for several years at the Des Moines Catholic Worker, uh, where they provided meals on a regular basis, and I helped with those on occasion. The number of veterans who came through there with homelessness issues and with mental health and PTSD and the array of things you talked about was very visible at that time, and it still is. Today, when I formally served on this committee in 2010, was about the time the first major deployments of National Guard folks from Iowa to Iraq and Afghanistan were occurring. And we were told that be prepared in six to 10 years, the fallout from that, personal fallout from that would start to be in evidence uh, in Iowa, and it, and it is. Um, and so I think the timing of these discussions are Good. Um, I feel personally that given the fact that our state guard was deployed internationally, uh, really for the first time in for a major war, I feel like the state has a special obligation to address these issues of the returning veterans. Um, and so anything you can do to help us advance that conversation and address those issues are appreciated. Could well, you I tell us? Could you tell us a little bit about your personal experience working with other public and elected officials around these issues? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can tell you that the the places where it tends to work best um, are the places where uh, the the local elected officials put together, you know, for lack of a better term, sort of like a tiger team. You know, uh, I'll use an example. Um, so, well, I'll use an example of, of a city that we're talking to right now, actually, about one that hasn't happened yet, which is I just got off a call uh, about 45 minutes before this one um, with Glendale, Arizona, which, you know, is basically Phoenix. Um, and what they're doing that is really advancing the conversation quickly and getting us pretty excited about making a Glendale campus happen is 
they put together a, a team of people to work with us from like a city attorney to somebody from planning and zoning, somebody from engineering. And then they also came forward with uh, potential plots of land that were city owned that they could nominate for us. So all of that stuff uh, really jumpstarts the process really effectively. And for us, particularly because when we start, you know, once we build a campus, we're going to have a staff on the ground. They're all going to be from the local community. But at the beginning, it's my national expansion team and I, which is in total six people, and we live in Kansas City. So having a, a single point of contact or, or a single you know team at the local level uh, to be our local champions initially is, is a really big part of getting this going. Um, and so uh, absolutely, uh, local elected officials uh, and elected officials generally can be a huge part of that because you're just really clued into the community. Like, you know who to call for stuff, right? Um, if you don't mind, I, I'll answer this question real quick uh, that I just saw in the chat. Are homeless veterans who have criminal backgrounds or are sex offenders allowed to stay in these tiny homes? Uh, we don't allow uh, sex offenders. Um, we uh, haven't been confronted with that, but it's part of our policy uh, that we don't allow it. Um, but as far as criminal backgrounds, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to mislead you. Uh, the truth is, is that um, two out of every three veterans have been justice involved at some point, have been arrested at some point. So if we were to say uh, that we were not going to work with anybody with a criminal background, well, then there's not a lot of, you know, we wouldn't be filling a huge gap at that point. Um, you know, when you talk about people who have experienced homelessness, people who uh, have had problems with things like PTSD, um, it's not to say they're always going to have criminal backgrounds, but the idea that they're going to have run it, actually, you know, one of the guys who uh, is one of the guys who was on one of the slides uh, that I showed you, say, you may remember he's standing there with his dog. His name is Chris. Uh, Chris is a great example of somebody who uh, he had um, been uh, a Marine in, in uh, Afghanistan and he had uh, had a, you know, he had a good record as a Marine. He was a staff sergeant. Um, you know, so, I mean, he was an E6. He was a senior non-commissioned officer. He came back uh, and he experienced, you know, issues with post-traumatic stress. The VA uh, was not able to really address those in a way that, that worked for him. And he ended up self-medicating. It's a relatively common um, tale, unfortunately. And so he had, he was in and out of jail and in and out of rehab with drug problems for several years. Uh, he became estranged from his family. Um, in order to support his drug habit, he had some, you know, like, uh, property crime stuff that was going on and was on his record. So if we were to say no to people with criminal backgrounds, we wouldn't have been able to help Chris. Today, Chris is married. Uh, he's about to graduate college uh, and he's a homeowner. Um, so uh, we do we do work with people with criminal backgrounds. And I would make one quick observation. You can comment on it if you'd like. Iowa does have some investment, uh, state and, uh, dollars included in a justice system that has Drug courts, mental health courts, veterans courts, specialized um, diversion programs. Thank you. Um, and I suppose having those might, would be helpful in connecting folks who actually need your type of assistance to your projects. Absolutely. And that's really our model, right, is to is to be a connector, is to uh, be a collaborator and a value adder, not not a competitor with any other programs. Um, to answer more specifically, I mean, it's not just that we don't have uh, sex offenders in the program. In general, um, we're not going to have people who have uh, a background uh, that has you know anything with crimes against children uh, or crimes, uh, you know, of a, a particularly violent nature. Um, and that's for obvious reasons, one of which is we have children in the village, you know, we have family units. Um, and so it's from a programming standpoint that that we're not able to accommodate folks with that background. But with the majority of, uh, you know, your standard criminal background that we might encounter, yeah, we do. Well, Jason, I want to thank you very much for your time and all this critical background information. I'm hoping this conversation will lead to some further conversations in the future and maybe some enhanced uh, opportunities and services for our veterans uh, in Iowa going forward. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you to all of you for your interest. Thank you, Representative Eisenhower, for making this a priority and for asking me to do this. And uh, I look forward to hopefully working with all of you. Great. Have, have a great day and we'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure thing.